In this video, we're going to explore caching in Spring Boot using a simple example. One thing we want to think about is where is the optimal place to put a cache. And here I have an architecture that we'd often see in a Spring Boot microservices application, where we have some kind of HTML view, and then under that we have an endpoint that's defined in a controller. Under that we have the service layer, which Sometimes when you're new to programming, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense what that service layer is for. But in this video, we'll see a good example of why we want a service layer. Underneath that, we'll have a data access object layer. Oftentimes under that, we'll have a CRUD repository or an extension of that interface. And then a persistence mechanism, which may be a database. So the service layer or the business logic layer many times will call down upon multiple DAOs. It could just be one, but many times it's aggregating data from multiple DAOs. And we see that there is a bit of heavy lifting after this DAO because it has to go to a persistence layer, which may be on a different physical server, different physical machine, maybe even a different network entirely. So it might involve a network call. That's why we like to do caching. So what we'll often do is we will annotate methods at the service layer and we will put a cache there. Now, what do we mean by cache? Well, think about what method calls typically are. In a method call, you're typically passing in a parameter and getting an object back, at least in a read method call in a fetch or some kind of fetch by ID method call. So think about the joke about what's the defin definition of insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting this, a different result. So if you pass the same lookup key or the same lookup identifier into a method over and over again, you should get the same result. Does it make sense that we should have to query the persistence mechanism every single time? Probably not. It would probably be a little bit more efficient if we took that result and we put it in some type of collection and we used the key, the find by ID key, and associated it with that result. So in future calls after the first call, we don't need to go to the persistence layer. Instead, we can simply go to this collection and say, hey, do you have a result for this key? If you do, then I would like to retrieve it. So why do we cache? We cache at that service layer. We could anywhere, but service layer makes a lot of sense. And why do we want to cache? Well, we know it's going to be better performance because we're taking a lot, a lot of load off of that persistence mechanism. In addition to that, it's better scaling. When you get to a high transaction volume, you could max out what a database could do in a reasonable amount of time. But with a cache, you're not hitting the database. You're reducing requests, again, in a high transaction volume situation. So because of that, the database is able to serve more users, and that essentially is scaling. Now we can also have distributed caching where we have caches that live closer to where the user physically is. We're not going to talk about that uh, in this lecture, but we're just going to take a look at a simple example. So we have exception handling. Uh, we'll think about how less chance of exception if we have less time we have to go out of our domain. Checked exceptions, the things where we have to wrap a try catch block, many times in Java that's because we are accessing something that is outside of the JVM, like a file system, like a database, something like that. So uh, service layer, we talked about why we want to do it there because that's where the DAOs are aggregated. So let's consider some trade-offs. The pros, we know increased performance and scaling as we just discussed. Less disk I.O., which makes the disk able to serve more people again. And then a scalable database, as we spoke. But, okay, what's the trade-off? Well, naturally, we have to configure the caching for one. The other thing is that the cache is going to store more data in RAM or in temporary memory uh, than it would without caching. So, essentially, we're doing a trade-off here where we are increasing RAM, uh, and the, the advantage is we're getting less disk I.O., less hits to the database. But we do want to consider that RAM. Maybe we want to bump up the RAM or at least the RAM allocation to our application server. This is easy to do in Spring Boot, so easy we'll do it right now. So first of all, on the application class, we need the enable caching annotation. And then on the method that we want to cache, we use at cacheable. And uh, we can use the method parameters as the key, and essentially the return type is the value that gets returned from the cache. So uh, we will, in a future video, we will take a look at a specific implementation of a cache called EH cache. Uh, one thing I wanted to call out in this video before we get to the more advanced caching, though, is be careful about debugging. This one caught me one time. 
Remember, if we apply a cache at the service layer, the very first time we do a lookup, it's going to go down and back up this entire stack. The second time we do a lookup with the same ID, it's going to stop at the service layer and return the result that was cached. The first time I dealt with caching, it was an implementation that somebody else wrote and I was not aware that it was present. And I set a breakpoint in a DAO layer, saw it hit the first time, then I went back and I kept requesting the data over and over again and I could not get the breakpoint to hit. So I tried a different lookup, breakpoint hit, okay great, I got that working. Tried that different lookup one more time, breakpoint didn't hit again. So just be aware that, yeah, I, I guess it sounds obvious in hindsight, but it sure didn't sound obvious at the time. Just be aware that your breakpoints down in the lower area are not going to hit when you're debugging if you have something that is cached. Let's go into our development environment and try this out. First of all, I'm going to the application class. This is where I start my Spring Boot application and it's annotated with the at Spring Boot application annotation, which gives us automatic configuration, component scan, and several other things. So I'm simply going to add a new annotation here, which is called at enable caching. And that tells Spring Boot simply to look for caching. If we don't provide a provider like EH Cache, it will just use a default in memory uh, uh, cache provider. And they say it's not ideal for production use, but good for trialing it out. But hey, that's exactly what we're here for is just trialing, trialing things out. So we'll go ahead and save that annotation. Now let's go to our service layer and Caching is only going to make sense on a fetch method, not so much on a save method, because then we have to talk to the database. So let's take a look at a couple. We have this fetch plants, which is where we're doing a search for plants. And so on this one, I'm going to add a new annotation. We'll say cacheable, and then we have to give it a name in quotes, and we'll simply say fetch plants. It will figure out that the search term is the key and a list of plant DTOs is the value. For our use, we want to import the org spring framework cache annotation. And we see we get that. We're all good. Looking at this, it looks like I don't have any other fetch methods now that are looking for an ID. Fetch all specimens. Yeah, we probably ought to leave that one alone. So I'm going to snap a breakpoint at the controller layer so we can see that the controller is indeed getting hit every time we do a search. I'm also going to snap a breakpoint at the DAO layer so we can see when that gets hit and when that does not get hit. One warning. Uh, walking through breakpoints gets a little bit trickier here going from controller to service because it has to wrap a little bit of magic around that service component. So before we could just step into, step into. Now if we step into, we end up getting into some caching classes, which is why I'm going to set a couple of breakpoints. So I will start with one at plant DAO. And what this is doing is this is interesting. This is reaching out to a JSON stream and it's parsing it. So there's definitely a bit of heavy lifting there. I've snapped a breakpoint on line 72. And also in the controller class, I have a breakpoint on the plant names autocomplete, which fulfills the uh, autocomplete when you're typing and it makes suggestions for you. Also, we'll do search plants. So I will snap a breakpoint on search plants. And let's take a look then. I'll go ahead and refresh my page. I've started in the debugger. I'm going to, with plant name, I'm going to start by typing W E S. And remember it requires, because this is an autocomplete, it requires three letters to trigger the autocomplete. One thing I'll warn you about is that normally you'll see the suggestions pop up here when I type when I type the third letter. Because I'm going to be tabbing back and forth, we won't see those suggestions. But nonetheless, we can still walk through the debugger. So W E S is in Western, and you notice the debugger fires. And where are we? Okay, we are in the plant names autocomplete. So let's step down. We see the term length is three. That's something that we put in earlier to say when we hit that minimum number of characters, let's go ahead and do a fetch against our JSON stream. So take a look and you see it's going to hit the plant service. Now the plant service calls the DAO. So when I step over, I anticipate that my DAO breakpoint will hit and the debugger will take us there. Sure enough, notice that it switched classes. Now we're in our retrofit uh, little library where we are calling the plants and we're going to parse it. You'll see that even though I'm clicking here, uh, it, there is a slight delay as it has to go out and grab that data. I go ahead and hit play and I go back to my page. And as I said, the autocomplete unfortunately won't come up, but guess what? Let me type in WES one more time. We'll see the debugger hit here. And now let's watch again, and notice as I step over each of these methods, very important one here, line 178, is the breakpoint going to hit in the DAO? If so, the debugger will switch. If not, it'll simply go to the next line, which is line 181, and it's reading 
the data that it cached the last time around. So we step over, note the DAO did not get hit. We did not access that DAO layer. Uh, we're simply reading this from cache. I hit play. Let's try a couple more experiments. Uh, what if I type in, let's say, um, Apple, A, P, P, and as soon as the P hits, just to confirm, uh, it is going to go back here, and I'll do this a little more quickly this time. Now, that is a different term. You see, the term, remember, is the default key. So the term represents the letters that the user has typed into our application, and that's the key that's in our cache. So what it's saying now is, okay, I have WES in my cache, but I do not have APP in my cache. So I'm going to have to go down and do a long fetch on that, but then once I get the result back, I will hold that in my cache. So we step over. Yep, here we go. It's in the DAO layer, so it's going to go out and fetch this because it doesn't have that APP key in the cache yet. We play and we go back. So anytime we use a new key, it has to go fetch a new cache. Now let's, let's do a couple more experiments. What if I go up here to the search box? This is using that exact same DAO. Different input form, but exact same DAO. What if I go in there and I type in WES? Remember, that's one of the things we already have cached. I hit search. Breakpoint hits again at the controller layer. No surprise there about the controller layer because that's above the cache. But let's go down and see, will it actually stop in the DAO? It did not stop in the DAO. It's only hitting the controller. You see we have our specimen service fetch plant. Remember, specimen service fetch plants, that is the method that is cacheable. Even though we're calling it from a different endpoint, it's still calling upon that cache and getting a list of plants that have the word WES. And this is a look at what is in that cache. I could do it again with APP. We know how that's going to turn out. Let me go ahead and try a brand new one. Let's try Oak. That's an easy one. So Oak, and I'll hit search. Breakpoint hits again. Right now we have WES and we have APP as keys in our cache, and we have the collection of plants that matches that in our cache as well. Now we're trying a new one, which is Oak. We do not have Oak as a key in our cache. So what happens here on line 125 when I hit step over? Does it go to the next line or does it go into the DAO to fetch the value that corresponds to oak? Step over and here we are again. Since it doesn't have that key, it goes down and says, okay, I need to fetch this data anew. So uh, it goes and fetches the data, returns back, and we'll go ahead and play from here. And now oak is in the cache as well. So just for fun, just one more thing, I'll go ahead and disable the breakpoints so that we can watch this work in a, a little bit faster mode and disable the breakpoint here. Okay, let's go back to our user interface. And all I want, I can type app for Apple. We get results. I can type east for Eastern. We get results. I can type, well, and by the way, EAS, that's a key I put in uh, before I pause the video for a moment. So that's why that one didn't hit. Wes, okay. Now if I say pine and I hit search, debugger hits because this is a key that does not exist. So we go ahead and we tell the debugger, uh, thank you very much. Go ahead and cache that. And now let's run back to home and let's look at our autocomplete. Once again, uh, with the debugger as it is, I can type EAS and we see now that I'm staying on the page, it's going to autocomplete. WES, autocomplete again. APP, autocomplete again. Oak, autocomplete again. Pine, autocomplete again. Uh, hopefully autocomplete again. Looks like we don't have any pines yet. Uh, and then we could go on and we could say uh, something we don't have like an amelink gear and the breakpoint hits. So you see, the more we access the cache, the more we're populating the cache. So this has been a look at caching, which is definitely a good idea, especially for enterprise applications today, because many times our applications are serving things like web browsers and mobile applications where we don't know how many devices are going to be accessing our application at any one time. So this is a very efficient and as you saw, a very fast way to increase the scalability, speed, and performance of your app. I hope this video was helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.